Right now with my refined or, or my base painting shaping up, as soon as I have everything kind of filled in and have a sense of where things should go, I'm going to want to change from just this basic kind of brush to something more interesting. And I'm going to show you how we can create our own brush even within Photopea. We can do the same thing in Photoshop. And the key is not really the shape of the brush we create, though that is neat. The key is how to use the brush settings, the attributes, to make a brush more, uh, more pleasing, more interesting to us. And we, we all might have different preferences. All right, so there's a lot more for me to do with kind of a, a focused base painting. But the next step, I'm going to save my work. I'm going to make sure that it does save. There it is. You can see the, uh, the extra colors added to my palette there. So now I'm going to make a new file, file new in Photopea. I'm going to make it 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. And instead of calling it new project, I'm going to call this Carl's brush or Carl brush. Doesn't matter what the DPI is. That's actually the pixels per inch because it's going to be a thousand by a thousand pixels. Then I want to click on the default colors. So black on white, pure black on pure white. And I want to use my pressure sensitive brush at whatever opacity. I'll keep it. And I want to create at 45 degrees a brush shape. Like if you were to take a painting brush, dip it in ink, and then just let the very tip of it touch the paper. You can do it with dots. You can do it with lines. When I do it with lines here, it's a little bit more like a bristle brush, like a hog's hair brush for oil painting and scumbling. If I do it with dots, it might be more like kind of an airbrush that spits out little dots. The more linear I make it, kind of like a big diagonal bar, the more it would be like a flat brush. The rounder I make it, the more it's like a round brush. So I kind of split the difference, make it a little bit wider in the middle. Okay, now that's your brush. You go up to edit and you go to where it says define new and then you're going to click on brush. And when you do that, in Photoshop, this is what's called defining a brush preset. We have our brush at full 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. So if I select everything, Command A and then delete it, and then I just click once, that's my brush. But my brush is now at 76%, right? So let's delete again, and let's play with it at a lower size, at a higher opacity, and we can make that brush pressure sensitive, right? Big to small. Now that brush looks more interesting already than a regular brush, but the problem is you see how repetitive it looks because it's locked at the same angle all the time. And though it's cool, it's a little bit better than a standard brush in building a, an interesting texture. It's not fully customized yet. So the next thing we're going to do is click on this tool right here. These are what are called brush settings and the tip dynamics. In Photoshop, it's called shape dynamics. That's what we want to play with. So we click on tip dynamics, play with size jitter a little bit. That means that the brush will just change a little bit, still based on pressure, but it'll have a slight variation. Sometimes the same pressure will make it a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. And as you're using it, it will make it kind of waver a little bit, just like a real brush. I like that. The most important one to me is what's called angle jitter. 
An angle jitter will mean that it's not always locked in the same angle. So when you use it, now its edge will have a lot more variation to it. And you can play with how much you want from angle jitter. With the tablets we're using, the only control we need is the pin pressure, the one right here. These tablets aren't expensive enough. You need like a thousand dollar tablet in order to be able to have like tilt and twist and twirl control. But you can set those in when you have that tablet ability within your brush. And that's what the control of the angle jitter would be. That the actual angle of your stylus dictates the angle of the brush. And that's really all we need. We don't need to play with scatter. That's harder to control. We don't need to play with color dynamics. That's mixing your foreground and background color automatically for you within your brush. We don't need to play with transfer. This is all we need to customize the brush. And then when we close this and we keep on this brush tool, you'll see that your brush is still set. And now, when I use it, I'm going to use it not at 100% opacity, but once we start building a refined paint layer on top of our base, this is going to be a new layer. I'm going to lock my base color, so I'll just show this on the face. Now, I'm going to use a flow that's not quite 100%, about 90%. And I'm going to use an opacity closer to 50%, pressure sensitive. And now when I start painting, I can still use option to choose colors. It's going to have this different texture. So you see my brush there. I'll just show it up close. And because it's at this lower opacity, it's going to show all of the layers underneath still. And it's going to mix with those colors. because my hand is still hovering over the option key to steal those colors. Now this is refined painting. It takes a while, but this is how we get that kind of finished paint texture that we want from the paint surface. See how everything kind of mixes together. The more layers we have, the more complex and controlled that fur can be. Right, so just that little area, you can see what it starts to do. So refined painting is going to make a big difference, but I'm still going to work on my base painting layer for now. Because I need to do what I did up here everywhere else. And I can go ahead and use my standard brush. I'm just going to use it at a higher opacity and at 100% flow because I'm still just trying to get my base color. I don't want these. There we go. Now, if you need to see your reference a little bit better, remember I have it all in this folder. I can move it around. So I'm going to work on the body, so this reference is really helpful for that. I know where the bottom of the chin is. And on my base color layer, I'm just going to start doing this. Now, because I'm using my custom brush, the texture is going to be a little bit more interesting, especially at the edges. And this really kind of is like refined painting already because I've already filled in everything with pixels. So the, the real definition of base color is that everything is filled in. It's like priming a wall or priming the shape before you put paint down. And as long as we control each pixel, there's really no right way or wrong way to do this digital painting. Uh, a lot of artists like to use really bold colors, like this red oxide kind of color is a nice base painting color. So then when you do refined painting, it kind of comes through each stroke for the warmth. So you can do that with warms and cools in your base color. There's just lots and lots of different approaches.
I won't show you the smudge tool until I've got all of this kind of base painting roughed in. And though doing an animal might be easier in the face than doing a human portrait, because they're more forgiving, we have a harder time telling if our likeness on animals is accurate than we do for people, being people ourselves. But because we have to do the full body of the animal, it's a little bit harder in terms of the anatomy and the pose. And so that that's what this base layer, I want to take the right time to kind of get that. And even at just 70%, I'm able to get kind of some of these in-between colors. But I'm not letting myself zoom in very much. I'm not trying to refine anything or soften anything. I'm just trying to get the right colors in the right places. Not even the right colors, the right values. The right, like, lights and darks. So I do a lot of squinting and a lot of mixing between. Holding down option. And even when an animal just seems to be a simple color, when you actually look at the photo reference, which is one of the beauties of using reference, you'll see how many individual colors there are within that. A brown dog has lots and lots of individual colors making up that brown. And as your painting style, you can definitely expand on that if you want. I'm bringing more of these crazy colors into this Siamese cat. into just these warm browns and yellows. Now the reason base color is so important is that's where your hard edges are put, you know, at higher opacities, like the edge of the elbow there. Once you're doing refined painting at only 50% opacity, it can be really hard to keep a hard edge everything gets softened that you touch so you need that strong structure underneath I have the top of the leg very warm. Don't be afraid of color. Why use white or gray when you can use like a, a pale yellow or an orange or pink? At any time, you'll see how important not the color is, but the, the value is. So if I just go to image adjustment, hue saturation, and I take the saturation down, all of a sudden this looks like a pretty photographic you know, model of that cat. Because what we're actually looking for are not the colors. My colors are pretty extreme. It's the values, the lights and darks that are going to give us the image. And I like to do more color rather than less because you can always take color away. Just like you can always take the sharpness of edges away. Computer's good at that. What it's not good at doing is adding in color because that's more subjective. That's what the artist is for. And that's what the AI algorithm is for. Once you tell it to do colors like Cezanne or Pizarro, When you find a color you really like, I really like this purple as kind of a substitute for black, you can add it to your palette. So you can see now what's the difference in a custom brush versus a standard brush. That's me doing a palette circle with a regular brush, standard brush, that's with my custom brush. 